biological pest control and leading our institution as the director of research. I'm privileged to welcome you, sir, to this academic session. Thank you, Suraja. Moderator for the session is Dr. Sudhir KP, the Associate Director of Research, Agriculture Engineering, and Co-Principal Investigator of NHEP CAST project. The project is primarily engaged in research on coconut-based value-added products and market engages. So this sir also heads the agribusiness incubator at KA. So this sir, your presence is greatly appreciated and a warm welcome to this session. Thank you. Thank you. Our distinguished speaker for the day is none other than Dr. Rashid Suleiman. He is one of the most renowned names in extension science and presently serves as the director, Center for Research on Innovation and Science Policy, Chris Hyderabad. He started his career as a scientist in agriculture extension at ICR, National Institute of Agriculture Economics and Policy Research, New Delhi, and left it to start his independent research initiative at CRISP. As a leading scientist of agriculture extension, he is managing and coordinating research programs in South Asia and is a member of national and international policy think tanks. A prolific writer himself, he will enlighten us on publication of social science research results. On behalf of all the participants and on my personal behalf, I welcome you, sir. Thank you. All the participants can post their queries in the chat box, which will be taken up towards the end of the session. Participants may also kindly fill the feedback forms in the chat box also before you leave, you, leave, leave the meeting. Now, I may invite Dr. Madhu Subramaniam, Director of Research, to offer his introductory remarks. Over to Director of Research. Thank you, Sulaja. And uh, you. good afternoon to everybody. Dr. Suthir, I can see Vinu, and a lot of others inside and outside KAU. And a most hearty welcome to my friend for the last 30 years, Dr. Rashid Suleiman. The job is uh, at once very easy and very complex. When I am to introduce someone whom I have known uh, for the last 30 years, the way we have known each other. She has been my classmate from a huge days. And uh, not only we have come to, of course, he was in extension, I was in entomology, but uh, we were together for PG. We were together at Delhi for PhD. And... Uh, during, of course, he left for uh, ARS, I came back, uh, joined an NGO platform. So uh, one thing, of course, there was a difference in the our areas of specialization, but still during my forays, after my own PhD, I had a foray into development sector and that brought us still closer because more than, I mean, th there was a fair overlapping of our professional interest during that period. I remember vividly our animated discussions on the concept of participation, on development, on the sharing of success stories on the ground. So many, so much. When I was in Hyderabad or in Delhi, or he used to be at my home in Trichur or Cochin, we used to have long discussions in the night about development, those concepts. Of course, I moved up beyond that into academics. And I'm happy that Rashid is where he is uh, because he followed his conviction as he always has. One of the greatest hallmarks of Rashid is uh, he doesn't wait for anybody. He just follows his heart. And uh, that has been how he has been. Uh, he was at ARA at, uh, I'm sorry, at ARA at the College of Horticulture and whenever that is one of the, his hallmarks. So, like I said, it is a not an easy task to introduce someone like Dr. Rashid Suleyma. You can see his bio data for the, there, but uh, uh, my own, I don't want to go into a more formal introduction because that will not be suitable at least. I cannot introduce him very formally and in a non-personal way. Rashid, I know this was one of the things that strikes me as was his passion in agriculture extension. And that passion he has maintained till now. His areas of specialization right from his, the start of his career has been, uh, one has been the agriculture education, especially extension education. 
that has been one of the uh, early areas of interest of Dr. Shri Suleiman. Then he moved into innovation systems because we know a lot of uh, development alternatives, development models are sprouting all over the country, all over the South Asia. I've personally been familiar with many of those contexts, but many of them are contextual and are intellect, uh, individualistic in nature. There will be a leader or a group of leaders. Once that leadership withers away, the movement comes to a standstill. There was a lot of examples all over South Asia. But uh, that is where systems come in, sustenance of uh, development efforts. So that is where Rashid Suleiman has concentrated, developing more uh, system, in, uh, innovating systems for development, agriculture development. And he has also forayed into uh, policy research. So over the last 20 years, he has built a formidable, formidable reputation for himself. He has been working with the government, state as well as national governments. And again, he has been like GFROS, now his favorite platform, CRISP, and then one of the largest uh, blogs, the networks like ASA. Been active all through his career for the last 20, 30 years. He tra has traveled wide and far across the globe. I, I, I don't know whether there is any country that Rashid has not visited. And his experience and his expertise, his publications, of course, he is the most suitable guy to handle a topic like this. I don't want to go into the lead list of publications, the policy papers. It's quite there. You just open Google it and you can find out how prolific a writer Dr. Rashid Suleiman is. So uh, that is about his career. Like uh, Suleja had introduced, she took a bold step in moving out of NCAP within three years. NCAP was also in its initial stages. There was a lot of space. He had a lot of space to work with uh, the directors. I personally know that uh, part of his career. But yet, he left that comfort zone to start something on his own. That is where uh, he is different from most of others. He started on his own. It was a bold initiative some 20 years back. So he has stayed on. And I'm personally very, very, very happy to see Rashid where he is. And I'm very, very proud of him also. He's also a family friend of mine. His family is well known to me, us. And uh, our children, both our children are agriculture, graduating in agriculture. His daughter, incidentally, is now postgraduate in agriculture economics from uh, IRA. So personally, there is very little that I don't know of Rashid Suleiman. Professionally, there is very little that I don't know of Rashid Suleiman. And introducing uh, the, the time may not be uh, enough if I want to say anything, everything that I want to know of Rashid. So I'm extremely pleased and extremely privileged to introduce my closest friend. Dr. Rashid Suleiman to deliver the lecture today. Rashid, okay. I have a wonderful time and I'm sure that the young scientists are going to benefit from your lecture. Okay. Yes. Thanks for the brief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, who is moving the slides? May I know? I, I'll do it for you, sir. Okay, so put the, can you put the slides on? Meanwhile, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, many thanks to Dr. Madhu for introducing me in detail. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, probably I think I will start with the, with the presentation. I'm also proud to say that I'm a product of Kerala Agriculture University. I did my graduation and post-graduation from, uh, from the College of Horticulture, Balanikara, long time back. I think this the whole thing was about 83 to 89. So I did my MSc and PhD and then I moved for my PhD. So that is where I am. So uh, let me see the first slide and then I will basically start talking. Okay, just a minute, sir. Ah, okay. So I worked with the Center for Research on Innovation and Science Policy, which was established in, in 2004. At the time I have been basically working in in, uh, in NCAP, National Institute of Agricultural Economics and Policy Research. I worked there for 13 years and then I left and then I joined. 
And uh, so currently, we, apart from CRISP, the Center for Research on Innovation and Science Policy, we also coordinate a network called Agricultural Extension in South Asia. So, which is basically six years we completed with the network. We did a lot of interesting things on extension. And which is a part of the global forum for rural advisory services. As I worked in economic, as I worked in an economic institute for 13 years, so I also know how the how economists think. So I think that has been a great advantage for me. So, so I, I don't see much of a difference in the way a social science approach, whether it is extension or or for economics. So, so the topic today is on publication on how do we publish social science or research. And in this presentation, I don't want to basically go into the kind of the mostly on the journal publishing or the impact factor or the ethics committees or all those kind of a thing. Definitely, we need a good research if we wanted to have a good uh, social science publishing. Uh, so you can see the slides. I'm not able to no. see the slide. Slides are not ready. OK, but I can keep on talking, I believe. Yes, yes, you can always. <laughs> yes. So my main argument, which I basically wanted to, to make in this presentation is that one is beyond academic journals, social science research can be published in several other formats. Publishing academic, academic journals is important, but uh, what I want to stress is that it, scientific journals is not the only way where we can publish social science research, and we should also publish outside the academic kind of a journal. So that is number one. And the second point is that we need to broaden the scope of our research beyond, beyond the conventional areas, beyond the conventional areas where the comfort zone of where we are where we are doing. For instance, I have seen many people continue to do what you have done in the MSc into the PhD, and then people are not comfortable to move out from the from that area. So people keep on working in that particular kind of an area. And the, another point is that the research should be relevant to the contemporary issues that policymakers are interested in. Social science, it has to be, we need to contribute to the kind of a kind of the policies. So I think we need to be, we need to do it, work on contemporary issues which bother a lot many people. And another point is that we need to have more interdisciplinary and interinstitutional research if you have to be successful. That means you know, it is not like single other publications, but I think we need to have more broader set of publications. And another thing is we should enhance our competence to write in a, for different formats, for different audiences. I think these are the kind of a few points which I will be emphasizing in this presentation. Are the slides visible? Slides? No. OK. No. So far, no. I think some technical issue. It came in between, but then. Yeah, it came in between. Ah. What happened? I think Binu Pivoni is managing, I think. <laughs> She's trying to. So you could have try from your side first, but I don't know. I think. Uh, no, I could have tried, but then I was not trusting the technical issue. Okay, technical okay. okay. <laughs> If any kind of a uh, internet, mm. if it fluctuates, sort of thing. so that is why I basically thought maybe it is better that. Mm. Binu, are you able to make it? Yeah, she is trying to put presentation. Yes. Put in the slideshow and can you move to the the second slide? Yes. Okay. Sir, oh, sir. Okay. Sir. Right. And, oh, uh, go back. Go back. Yes, sir. This, this yes, one. sir. Okay. So this is 
what I have been talking about. That means if you want to be successful, you need to broaden the scope beyond your conventional or narrow area of research. And it should be relevant to the contemporary issues. We need to have more interdisciplinary and inter-institutional research. That means you need to have basically authors from other institutions working with us for a number of reasons. Because it broadens your expertise, it broadens your, maybe it deepens your uh, contribution to that kind of a topic. And also, you basically get benefit from using a different types of methodologies. And definitely, you need to basically you should have competence to write for different formats. You cannot have the same format. Like you, you cannot have a a format like writing a research paper won't fit for many other kind of things for a policy brief, for a blog, for a working paper. So you need to have different styles for different types of kind of a thing. Go to the next slide. I basically wanted to talk about why we why we publish. What is the reason that why we publish? And especially as social science scientists, why why we publish? Can you move to the next one? And next one. Because normally I ask uh, people why we publish, and we get different uh, reasons why we publish. I think instead of doing that, I just to to say why why we publish because. One is it is vital for progress of science. Free exchange of information, build on new findings. And we have been seeing it currently in the COVID-19 kind of a situation. We have we all want basically wanted to know about the research findings on whether we get a vaccine for addressing um, COVID. So we need to basically build on what has basically, what are the tried and tested maybe vaccines previously, what are the other medicines which we have been trying to do. I think for science, publishing is so important because that is how we basically build on the knowledge. And for many people, it is also important for career improvement because you need to have a minimum set of a publication sometimes if, you're, if you wanted to be, if you when you go for any, they will basically ask you for what are your publications. Because that is one way of maybe making an assessment of what we have done, like done previously. And people want recognition because there is recognition. So I think uh, this is important that you publish, so that is important. Another for the governments, for example, if, the, if there's a public funding involved, this is one way to basically for the government to, to understand whether the, whether the money has been spent you know, really well on the kind of research, because it's, a, it's also a measure of accountability. And another thing to provide policy advice to a number of you know, states because they also they also basically look to science and social science for addressing many of the kind of you know the problems which people face people people face the societies face. We'll go to the next one. So what we are seeing is that uh, most of the people generally go into a publishing scientific journals, and most of us know. I just wanted to talk about it, though we know, most of us know, but maybe some of the research scholars or maybe young, young students uh, may not be young scholars, may not be knowing much of it. So normally, all scientific or research paper kind of a common format, introduction, review, objectives, methodology. We know we know all those kind of things, not discussion, questions, kind of a thing. So we write, a, we write a paper, then send it to the kind of an editor. Editor makes a quick assessment whether it should be sent for a, sent for a review or they wanted to reject at that stage itself. If the paper is not fitting into the scope of the journal, they would like to basically uh, do that. Uh, just a minute. And normally two, three anonymous reviewers examine the paper and they make a recommendation to the editor. And the editor takes a decision whether we wanted to accept it. Most of the times directly, most papers are not accepted because at least there will be some revision. Maybe it could be major or minor and then uh, reject. And then the others resubmit it. But we sh you should also have some sympathies for the reviewers. Basically, most of the reviewers, at least in the international journal, they spend a considerable amount of time reading your paper, and most of their services are unpaid in most cases. Like we have been seeing it in, in the journal, which I am an associate editor. Next slide. In the, in the Journal of Agricultural Extension and Education, which is published from the from Wageningen. We, we, we put a lot of time actually in, in reviewing, and not only me, actually, many of the reviewers whom I have been basically requesting <laughs> uh, help as a reviewer. I think I can see the faces of some of these people already in this group, like, you know, 
speak uh, um, binu many of them have basically helped help me in terms of getting the papers reviewed and the key questions which are being posed are will the readers of the journal be interested in this topic so that is one thing which they generally make a decision is it advancing our understanding on the topic is this relevant for a global audience especially you know international journals look for whether it's an interest and is it policy relevant whether it's a economic social science journals in general basically look at these are the kind of key questions they basically wanted to see in the data the next slide and uh, we will say nice on the things because people really don't know how to write an introduction to the paper many people believe that it is an introduction to the topic now if you are basically topic talking talking about an evaluation of a of a watershed a paper on that then people basically will write on the whole watershed and watershed is important and they there are two, there are two countries that contribute a lot many papers for some reason and many of the papers don't fit into the kind of science no we feel bad in rejecting the kind of a papers we try to help in terms of giving major kind of you know comments for revision people submit it but many times you know people also get feel disappointed that no it is a good work which we did but then uh, the reviewers rejected it and go to the next slide and then we basically go to a through a kind of a stage you basically get angry with the reviewers fortunately anonymous but people feel bit disappointed and many times what they they do is that no they submit the same paper to the next slide they basically without even addressing the kind of a comments i have seen that they submit it they send it to the another journal which needs a different format altogether but they don't look into the other guidelines or basically you know look at what is the scope of that particular journal they don't want to put any additional work so then they send it to the next journal which will get definitely rejected because it is not written in the in that particular kind of a style so we both many of us have gone through even my papers have been rejected we all, i'm sure many of our uh, papers have been rejected at different kind of a stages so you basically go through a denial okay no 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 the reviewer is right the journal is bad we feel very angry then we think okay let us try and maybe you know try to resubmit sometimes you no know, you don't get you no know, they are basically people get depressed and uh, then finally they accept so this is a kind of a process which is a i would say it is an occupational risk which we all go through in our in our profession so i think this is it next slide but the, but the, but there are bigger uh, issues this is something in extension i think in 2014 15 people have we had a discussion on where where we can publish extension so i'm just not going to talk about the extension because uh, many people thought maybe we can only publish in in journals which is having an extension title maybe like the indian journal of extension education or the maharashtra journal or which is the now the asian journal or maybe in you know, a journal of extension research from tamil nadu or maybe from another journal from udaipur or agra people basically have a they basically wanted to publish in only and then they believe that you no know, there are no many so people ask these kind of a question so we realized at the at crisp and it is that no we need to basically provide some advice to people on where we can publish extension research next slide so that basically brought us to a kind of a we basically a uh, developed a note at that time it is still in the available in the web it is still relevant i would say because uh, where can we publish extension research next slide in that one where we basically provided a uh, several types of journals we think we listed at that time about 100 and 198 journals where basically extension related or social science articles could be published the same thing in in economics also beyond uh, indian journal of agricultural economics and agricultural economic research review in india there are basically you know, there are many other and and also the journal of agricultural marketing these are the three most three important journals where the indian uh, economic indian agricultural economists you know, tend to kind of publish but there is a number of other journals where many of us have published and there are people who have been publishing in journals related to rural development social science research food policy world development knowledge technology and policy social science and humanities so climate change journal of sustainability agricultural systems field crop research 
these are all multidisciplinary journals where there's a lot of scope for extension people on, and also for economics to, to publish. So I think, but, then, but we normally don't basically look into some of those kind of, a, kind of a journals. And the next slide, which I believe is, is a bit more critical and which is very useful, is that uh, I think another thing is that you know, we basically, myself and Dr. Sedram and Shivumar, we basically did a kind of a, uh, looked at the extension to search in India and where we are publishing. I think this is the working paper which is available in, in the ESA website. We found that most of our most of the papers are published in disciplinary journals. That is where you have an extension title on the on the topic. We only most of them publish in Indian journals only on very narrow themes, maybe on impact evaluations. Uh, most cases are coming from the MSc or the kind of a PhD thesis work. Data is often considered as only the kind of a farmer's data. Whereas if you if you have to make some sense in social science research, it is not that only farmers are the the are the stakeholders from which we should only we should collect data. We should basically be collecting data from a number of other sources. I'm not talking about a primary and secondary source, but from researchers, from extension agents, from policy makers, consumers, or maybe the other knowledge intermediaries in the extension space, NGOs, uh, so I think. Most of the papers we have been seeing are mostly from the farmer data collection. And very few papers are basically published outside international, international disciplinary journals and multidisciplinary journals, which I mentioned a, a few of them. And most of the research are coming from either from the small community and maybe ICRSAU will be the maximum kind of a collaboration, but very few found interdisciplinary and interinstitutional research, which is mostly important in these days. Actually, we need to that. And there are a lot of language writing style challenges. As I said, the same paper is being sent to different journals, which many of the journals need a different set of different type of, um, of a format. And other kind of and our social science research is rarely looking at inclusion access. For example, maybe you know, for example, crop insurance. Maybe how many basically is is all the all the classes of farmers are basically having those kind of things, or maybe inclusion on many other kind of things, gender on the governance and partnerships, stakeholders, how do we basically make this whole other examples where we have a much more inclusive governance in extension or research, public private partnerships, then this whole science technology innovation studies, that is a kind of a, a black box in, 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 in our social science research because we normally don't look into science technology innovation part. There are very few studies or maybe there are not actually no studies on because agriculture, water, energy kind of a thing. So I think these are, these are the areas where maybe people talk about few food, energy, and water. So there are no system level kind of studies are not there. Then evidence based practices contributing to the science of uh, science of delivery. I think Madhu and me had a discussion few maybe few weeks back on on this whole uh, how do we enhance the impact of biocontrol? A lot of research, a lot of money has been spent on biocontrol. Several technologies have come up, but I think when you look at the aggregate at the all over the India, so what are those kind of issues? And many, of, for example, in that, if you are dealing with a study on bio biocontrol and how do we enhance scaling of biocontrol, we need to have a combination of both basically entomologists as well as maybe in a social scientist. So we need to have more research on these kind of things. Another is this whole issue of scaling up. Very little research on how some organizations have been successful in scaling up maybe new knowledge. And this whole studies on scaling out, scaling up. These are all rich areas where social scientists can really make a contribution. And there's a global data of sustainability, agroecology. These are regulations. This is a kind of a process. How we basically engage with public engagement science? What is our position on the kind of a GMOs? There are very little research, there are very little being published by the agricultural social scientists. I think if you, these are the areas where there is a lot of scope, lot of interest, lot of scope for publishing in high impact, multidisciplinary journals as well as maybe international social sciences. So I think, so if we don't address some of these kind of things, we won't be able to be very successful in, in journal publishing. But now I basically, I want to move to the kind of you know other other aspects, other formats where we can publish. Next slide. I think the and the basic question is uh, 
why I am writing for whom? Are we clearly know the audience for which we have been writing? And the second question is, uh, who are you? In the sense, as social scientists, our own kind of uh, image and what are how we basically present ourselves. So that's also an issue in many cases. Next slide. If you ask many scientists, maybe in the, in the ICR SAUs, they talk about maybe you know our role is basically research, teaching, extension, kind of a thing. Very few people talk about themselves as okay, you know, I am a policy analyst, or maybe I am an expert in this particular area. Okay, I provide consultancy services, I can advise people, I, I am a reviewer. See, we basically are much more than what our kind of a day job in terms of maybe you know we are doing a bit of a research, we have basically taking classes, kind of a thing. So we can be a blogger. So I think evaluation specialist, because social scientists have a lot to do in, in evaluation. It's not merely economic evaluation, but I think there are all types of evaluation. So I think uh, this public, this perception, I think even in uh, in many institutes which I have seen, where social science social sciences have a kind of you know being sometimes being treated not at the kind of a level with an agrobiological scientist. So that's why you know many times you know we end up as uh, vehicle in charge or maybe you know the library you know in charge many of the other non kind of a very important but i think not considered as a kind of a science task are basically dumped on us and uh, so there's a lot of we need to do a lot of work on our makeup actually in terms of how we present ourselves in the kind of a in this discipline so if, for example if you take the next case one out we be analyst or an expert we should be able to also write next slide I was basically thinking that now we are not doing even a kind of a enough review papers. Most of our papers are research papers, and there is very little on the review papers. As you know, research papers basically look at something on a narrow on a narrow topic. We basically look at it, whereas the review papers are looking at the kind of a broad kind of a state. There's a lot of demand for review papers, and very and then you and for review papers you don't need to do a kind of a field work. It is not about you can do it even do it outside the office hours actually in the review papers but then these are all so important in social sciences because it provides a summary or a synthesis of the findings it helps in examining the current relevant state of state of the art maybe for example i am just talking about because we have been a lot of work on agri business incubation i think every institute is now trying to create a new incubation center so a lot of money is being but actually, we re many of us, maybe, and many policymakers really do not know okay, what we have learned from maybe the last five years of promoting business incubation. I think many, many, for example, Nanam, maybe Nanam Manage, maybe at, uh, Ikrisat, and then a range of maybe Irma. There's a range of, but there is very little information on what does it mean of maybe five years we did this, what are, what, what is it? What can we learn from what could be improved? What is the literature talking about it? People might have, I'm sure people have published on, on uh, articles on, on, on agribusiness incubation and what they have achieved. So I think we don't have any of those kind of thing. Next slide. We basically did a few, I think in the, this, this was also a discussion about the whole ICTs. I think ICT discussion started in the early 2000s. Maybe at that time it was on, maybe on, uh, E-centers, e I think we have seen in Kerala, the, the Akshaya centers, uh, MSR have started doing, at the time the whole technology was around computers and internet centers, uh, kind of a thing. Then overall time now, because we have moved into the, we have moved into, into mobile, digital, kind, more digital kind of a thing. But actually, you know, in 2012, we basically did a kind of a paper on what is, what, what is the role of uh, ICTs in putting technology to use? Are we only, what, what are we doing? Are we only promoting, we are only pushing certain information or messages, or are we doing it in terms of uh, monitoring programs or maybe in terms of getting more structured feedback? Are we doing it in terms of you know, evaluation, even in designing programs, for example, like the like the GAS and all those kind of things being used in what should run in? But in most of the stories are all about call centers and we have been sending SMS kind of thing. So there's a lot of people are interested to know about what is the, this is a, a, even a good example of a, how do we write a review paper? It is basically, a, you have to have an access to the kind of a published database. So I think that is basically what you need. I think many institutions have that if you have basically access to online databases. So it's a kind of a desk work 
but this is something which is a which social scientists could do another next slide is another one of the one of the recent uh, good review papers which i read recently is this on nutrition sensitive agriculture so this is something which is very relevant currently you know the portion of the the new national nutrition mission people are trying to integrate agriculture into nutrition but uh, and there's a lot of discussion i think at least the fao and many other organizations have started on how do you basically use agriculture intervention interventions beyond the health and uh, maybe women and child development kind of thing maybe beyond this angan wadis or asha workers address nutrition supplementary feeding or maybe vaccination agriculture can play a, a lot a lot of a role but i think this is a good nutrition sensitive agriculture what have we learned so far the point is it is not that we basically only look at the kind of a good farmers maybe we will have a sample size we do a kind of you know if you are random sample or a, so our most of the focus has been on the, what the type of research which we normally do at the msc level so that is what, that is what basically gets continued so we believe that it is all about sampling size and finding out the appropriate methodology but there's a lot which we can do on the on the research review side next slide uh, another as i said because it is beyond research academic journals review paper is also an academic journal kind of a thing there are a lot of other scope for book chapters policy papers policy brief discussion papers blog good practices which i will come to soon manuals guide book review social scientists can publish in in, in all these different formats i think so this is what i basically wanted to talk from the, from from this point onwards next slide this is i basically wanted to talk about from my our own experience because otherwise you can browse and find in the google a lot of good practices on good practices in or maybe how to write a policy brief or how to write a blog there are so many things but i'm just basically talking from maybe so that there's a kind of a personal kind of a touch and i basically talk confidently from our own experience this is a we started at chris we basically did this uh, looking at this whole climate change for the last maybe not 3 or 4 years we are not doing any kind of a a modeling or what will happen when 1 degree rise in temperature will lead to maybe 2 meters sea level water level rise so that is not the kind of thing the question is what is the role of extension advisory services in in dealing in supporting farmers to adapt to this adapt adapt to climate change i think that is an area where which we have been trying to trying to work on and we published one is the kind of an you know, fao the food and agriculture organization was basically trying to develop a climate smart agricultural guide where we gave a kind of a chapter then we basically developed a, where we talked about what are the kind of a roles what are the current roles extension advisory services are performing what what are the for example if climate smart agriculture has three pillars and you know, we all know about it enhancing sustainable increase in yield uh, support to adaptation support to uh, to mitigation so we have been we have been doing enough on adaptation and mitigation we have been doing mostly on the other other two kind of things so i think we have basically looked at what is the current roles which they have been playing and what are the other roles which uh, Uh, which we are not doing so i think we did a this kind of you know on the climate change and, and and another paper is on the enabling advisory enabling environment what all needs to change because it's not climate change is not merely about farmers adapting a particular variety or a stress tolerant variety it is much beyond that so it is also about coordination at a higher level it is also about access to climate funds so are we able to do that what capacities needs to be built up and another paper which we did on what can we learn from upscaling of climate smart agriculture from globally from other countries so these are the kind of areas so there's a lot of demand on dealing with contemporary issues and each one needs a different set of style because the, the second one is enabling advisory services again if a policy brief one is a discussion paper and another is basically a kind of a chapter to be a bigger document so we also need to be to to follow that kind of a style so it's not like you write your own independent paper because it's linked to the all the other papers in the volume next one other one is the blogs i think this is the kind of a we published a lot of blogs and just put a one slide on which are all about mostly dealing with the research methodology big point what is happening in extension research currently and what needs to basically what new improvements are required what needs to basically change a lot of our own colleagues wrote who are basically concerned about the status of research 
on why we are not able to do much better, what needs to change, what type of capacities are required. So people wrote a number of blogs, and we basically, in the Agricultural Science Association, we published a number of these kind of a blogs. And next slide, we will, I will just show you what are the news, what are the, the recent blogs we publish. We publish basically, we have so far published about 125, I think we published the 126 last week, yes, we, we, we published. So these are all written by, by extension people, even economists. Basically, both economists and extension people are basically contributing blogs to uh, Box DSI. You look at these are all the kind of a contemporary, contemporary issues, and uh, this is not about people earlier thought of the blog is yes, anybody can write. It cannot. It's not, and uh, it's only a kind of an opinion. No, it's not an opinion. It's only. An, it's not merely an opinion. It's an opinion supported with. With uh, evidence, I, when you have time, I would like request you to have a look at some of these kind of blogs because this is where the social scientists get their they get their views and opinions and their and their ex expertise and experience published. And you get a, you have you are a blogger, you have a face, you have a basically an, a, a kind of an image in your own kind of a profession. And now all organizations are having having their own organizational blogs even. I think many are basically moving into the social media. Next slide. So, and our experience with publishing blogs, because we have been technically editing all the blogs and finally we are basically getting it language edited. Every, everything is language edited in our organization. We have seen, because you know, when you have, when you have seen all these blogs, these writing skills vary, vary considerably. And initially, people were when you asked them, oh, you know, who will publish, uh, who will write blog, what marks we will get in the assessment, maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.25. If I spend my time on doing a writing a research article, I will get maybe you know two credits in my assessment. Whereas if you write a blog, people you won't get. I think this is the kind of a feeling many people had. But I think when we started basically gaining traction. So many people are basically, we are now in a position not able to deal with, since we are now taking more time to deal with the blogs. Because earlier it was, we have been writing to people to get blogs, but we are getting a lot of blogs. But blogs are other iterations. I don't think any blog we have published without at least, uh, at least twice or thrice. I think the average is probably three times we basically give technical kind of a corrections. And many people really do not know how to write a blog and how to write a research paper. Many people start with our, the whole, the story. I think many that people believe that whenever we start write a paper, we need to talk about the green revolution. For example, when India got independence, our footprint pressure was 50 million tons. Now this is the so people have a tendency to write about a number of these kind of things, a story and uh, and sometimes they talk about if it's a particular on a crop, then they will say the scientific name of this is the uh, and then this crop originated in this part. And we have a history of 4,000 years, kind of a thing. So we do this kind of in a blog where you blog, you need to directly come into the kind of a point. What are you, what is your message you wanted to convey? So I think people really, so we need to have, so people need to learn. And learning is only possible when you start reading a number of blogs and you know how, what is the kind of style. And recently, my uh, the editor sent me a warning actually, saying that I suggest you convey to ESA that they specify a word limit on blogs. And she said a lot can be said in a fewer words and makes for faster reads. Unless the website imposes a word limit, it's hard to cut much as there is no stipulation to do so. Because normally the blogs are usually, I think, 1,000 to 1,500 words, very short. But we have been very liberal in the sense, you know, our blogs have been much more, maybe average, maybe 3,000 to 4,000 kind of words. People say it is it is becoming much more detailed than a blog. We said, OK, it's OK, but we basically wanted to make sure that we we have we basically make this kind of an opinions with evidence or so simply stating something and not without any references. But we have basically we have basically uh, worked hard in terms of uh, tightening it. But still, people really don't know how to do a tight way. So you need to learn how to do it in one sentence, one paragraph. Our editor basically said to, to cut and rewrite. But it's all fine. But uh, the point is we need to basically price maybe more of these kind of things. The next one. Uh, I think uh, you have seen this. You know, this is a website from, I'm just taking it from the 
climate change uh, food security climate change agriculture and food security the ccaps website is a cgir kind of a program they, they they are very good in blogs they publish a lot of blogs and uh, but they also have a very good communication team that is basically helping people to many states don't have that actually the Kerala Agriculture University or any organization which I'm just saying, we should have a mechanism to have, we should have a good editorial editing service. I'm not saying this is to recruit an editor, but uh, we should have resources to basically hire editors. Our editors are not, they are all basically freelancing. We basically take them on when we need them, or we need, we need them more often these days, especially since we have in the last two months, we published a lot after the COVID-19. So, I think that our editors are the most well paid in our in our office because you no, know, we pay them based on the words. So, I think we pay basically it's a one rupee per word is what the editors charge. It very well. So this is the, also the right which you know, CGA are so good editors. I think you no, know, it's very difficult to get good editors and then they are costly. So I think this is something which we need to learn. But organizations should should be able to do it. Next slide. And in the CCAVs, what they do is that every research paper that they publish, they basically also convert, a, they make a small blog out of it. So it the blog serves as the teaser, and then the working paper, or basically the paper is basically linked to that. So I think, so you promote it in the social media as a blog with the, with the bigger paper at the end, so that now those who are interested will basically download that paper and use that kind of a paper. We need to learn a lot from how organizations I'm not saying these are all basically what the individual should be doing. These are all basically what the organization should be doing. For example, the center, your, the CASP center should be doing some of those kind of a thing in terms of having these kind of a promoting, helping people to publish. I was talking to somebody recently. They said actually like in Germany, I think the universities basically, their policy is that they basically wanted everybody, in, if whatever you send outside for publishing should be edited. And this is basically paid from the institute budget. They, university budget so i think we need to make sure that no this is something which we should be doing next slide i think i'm taking a bit more time so i think i'm just uh, another one is all good practice note if you look at the global forum for rural advisory services they have a lot of good practice notes because this has been a demand for the research managers not the research managers i think development managers uh, people who are basically uh, program managers they all wanted to know very quickly what type of approaches works well they have only very little patient they have very little time so you need to have about four pages on good practice notes on maybe whether it could be on farmer field schools what are the advantages disadvantages what is the global experience so far and could be with the use of radio so there have been several they need basically very practical information on what they should be they are not going to read a book on or maybe a research article so so we basically you're trying to look for people who practice in note within four pages or maybe in a maximum six pages. And the next slide, we have been also at ESA, we have been also publishing uh, good practice notes. The recent ones you can see I think that is on the good practice. I think this is about practitioners talking to other practitioners on what they have, what they did, how, what lessons they have learned, what challenges they faced, and how these have been addressed. So I think this is also a very a great area where the social scientists should be able to to do it next slide we have basically i'm just good showing you maybe in a first i think these are the slides maybe you know just you know the cover the images which i'm showing for example madhu road fund something on the on this experience with promoting ipm in paddy in palakkad so this is under the the top right one is from the kvk and how they basically set up farmer producer companies the bottom left is is on on from orissa where how how the Orissa Livelihood Mission and the uh, Azim Premji Philanthropic Initiative work together with other NGOs in terms of promoting literacy on nutrition, promoting kitchen gardens, how they have come to that. And the bottom right is the is also recent from, from Kerala. It is on the whole kind of you know from the mango story from Mudalamada. It's been it's all talked about in the press, but this is a kind of a very systematic assessment of what they did at each stage is written by an agricultural officer and assistant director of, uh, of agriculture on their stories in terms of what they did, what are the kind of a challenges they faced in de developing an alternate marketing market, alternate value chain. 
in terms of marketing mangoes at the time of COVID crisis, lockdown when they are not able to send it to the export market. So I think these are all very interesting ways in which social contribute to the to the science of delivery, to the sense of how do we improve our own performance. Next one. So there are, there are other papers which we have been which we have been doing on policy papers, policy papers or thematic notes. We did something on the kind of the new extension that is on what type of skills in the 21st century extension people need. The point is that many of these kind of things, what you need is more of a subject depth and on what is happening globally. It is not about collecting collecting farm data. I'm not saying we need it many times, but what I'm saying is that research should not be in social science research. Doesn't mean that we are basically go and have a, a research methodology. You go to do, to do this kind of thing. Another is in 2015 when there's like the, the year of family farming. Maybe this is something on how do we basically address advisory services for for family farming. We did a, uh, a study on the whole agricultural extension curriculum, which we published as a working paper. See, working papers, many organizations have working papers, maybe social science or, uh, organizations, departments have, for example, IFPRI has its own kind of working paper series. Many, many organizations have, because the one advantage working paper series is that you don't have a kind of a limit. Because we wanted to publish in a research journal, you should have sometimes 6,000 to 8,000 kind of words. Initial drafts, you may, you may need to get some uh, comments from reviewed from a number of people. So what? So many times people publish working paper immediately after you finish your research, but then you get it, you in, leave it for about five months, six months. You get a number of comments. You that will help you to shape that into a kind of a scientific. Excellent. That is on the policy briefs. Because writing policy briefs is a different game because you need to have do it in a four pages. It could be an outcome of a study or a policy dialogue. So it can be, so you organize a policy dialogue. I think many organizations do policy dialogue, but then everything ends with that policy dialogue. We may have a kind of a proceeding somewhere, but there is nothing which is, uh, which is available publicly as, a, as an output of this policy brief. I think whole policy brief ideas when we started it at NCAP, the idea was that most of the most of the key policy makers don't have the civil service, maybe IAS bureaucrats. They don't have the time to read a big document, a policy paper or a research journal. They are not going to read at all. They, they don't have the time. They don't have the aptitude. But they are all very keen to know in four pages. So people think that okay, now they will take it in the evening. So maybe some of them will read in the car or maybe in the metro when they they go. They can easily read it. What is it? So policy briefs are very important in especially in policy relevant social science research. Next one. Another, another is the scientific things which I've been trying to do in terms of diagnosis. See, people wanted social scientists to quickly assess and find out reasons for why certain things happen. For example, this is a study which we did in, in Bihar, where the government has been enhanced investments in the last uh, 10 years on, on the dairy sector, in, and they have enhanced the number of artificial inseminations, vaccinations, many things they have, they have done. But the dairy production productivity remains low. They basically wanted a quick study in two months to, to find out what are the incidents. They know that there have been issues at the higher level. It is not that farmers don't adopt kind of thing. That is not often the reason. There are bigger institutional and policy challenges. So help in having a kind of a quick diagnostic paper on what is the what are the issues which we developed as a policy incoherence in small order diarying. So we use an innovation systems kind of a, a framework to do this kind of a study. Another is on how do we scale out sustainable intensification? What needs to be done? It is not that we need to have more demonstrations and more trainings alone will not basically bring. So there are issues beyond the beyond the farm level. There are issues in terms of coordination, in terms of funding, in terms of organizational capacities, in terms of markets. So I think we need people need some of those kind of things. Next one. Uh, other is uh, we have known say into writing manuals. I think one of the manual on good practice in extension research and evaluation, which is available at on the it came out as an output of a output of a, a workshop which we did in 2015 or 2016 with NAM, um, with Manage and ICR, CTCRA. So then we learned how to basically write a manual 
so different style step wise is you know, it should be short modules how do you write it so you need to learn how to basically and nobody will teach you how to basically write a manual you look at 10 manuals and then you basically learn imbibe the kind of a style but there is a lot of demand for manuals currently we are basically working with the government of orissa in terms of helping them with the with the training of trainers manual on uh, you know, for the samitis the state extension management training institutes on value chain extension how do you promote facilitation for development because the samitis they have money they have basically staff but then they are not trained they really don't know the, the content how do and they also do not know how to deliver so it is a different type of a game where we have exercises cases so we need to provide a lot many other kind of a things if you really wanted to to develop again if a manual next one uh, another is the kind of a there's a lot of demand for consulting in social sciences so and then this this number is basically going up actually there's a lot of demand for people it not not only on evaluation sometimes uh, consulting is on basically you know doing a small evaluation study it could be maybe a, a, an irrigation project or a economic evaluation of a watershed kind of a project or it could be an evaluation of you know, atma but most of the i think the prop, the the difficulty with consulting is that you have to perform it in a very in a very limited number of days so you need to be very quick in delivering and most of our experience is sometimes you may get a consultancy for 5 days or maybe you know 5 days to maybe 15 days or 20 days maybe spread over 2 months or 3 months but then the the skills you need is the ability to review synthesize link other sources of knowledge and the sectoral knowledge so i think from the ground to the kind of a policy level understanding which we which we need and sometimes you get maybe another you know, organization willing to give you a maybe a, maybe a, Three day or a five day consultant consultancy to to review document, provide inputs, or maybe to participate in a kind of a workshop. So these are all opportunities for social scientists. But then you need this kind of a kind of a skill in terms of synthesis. How do we basically synthesize a large number of information? So I think this is a kind of a skill which we need to develop. I think I'm going to the last slides. The last next slide. I think to conclude, actually, you know, I think only there's only one more slide. One is publishing. definitely needs uh, quality research good presentation and sometimes a bit of a luck also is needed because it all uh, for example in uh, the type of reviewer the journal sends in your kind of a paper so his or her understanding on the kind of a topic uh, so it, 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 it you need a bit of a luck but then uh, you also need a good quality research and a good presentation rejection rates are generally very high to ensure quality so you should not be worried about it because good journals also provide a a lot of suggestions on improving your paper but and then the publishing in journal articles is important but but many decision makers rarely read the journal articles so if you wanted to have an impact so impact and impact factor are two different things back factor you talk about the kind of you know journal what is the impact factor but i think if you really want to have an impact as a person as a as a professional you should also be willing to write for outside i would say the journal beyond journal articles there are several ways to publish and promote your work and we should fully utilize these and the last slide and the next one is about uh, just wanted to say what are the key capacities of publishing because the topic is on publishing social science research one is we need to really know the advances on the topic specialization and we should have better understanding from the field level to the kind of a policy level for example if you are talking about small farm mechanization so we should also know the kind of a, what are the kind of a policies talking about it what the maybe if it's a uh, doubling farmer income committee is the committee making a reference to to the kind or maybe niti ayog talking about small farm mechanization so we need to know not merely the kind of a, the, the details of the engineering but we also need to know the kind of a sector what is happening in the sector we need to broaden the social science research method beyond the parent discipline that is why partnerships with other social scientists are, are a must so it is not that no it is possible we may do it but i think we have to do it and skills related to working with those outside your field of specialization so i have been seeing when we we are a part of an another review because uh, most of the our social scientists there's a lot of good social sciences outside icr saus not only in the icssr institutes but also in iits where there are department of you know, social science and humanities bombay delhi chennai 
So there are a lot of, they all have a very much multidisciplinary social science, science scientists. And there are many people, many within the CSIR who have been looking at science, technology, innovation policies, IITs include. There have been many people. So I think we need to also know how to work with other, other others who can who can bring a different perspective so that it's like a cross-fertilization of ideas and be published and writing for different formats. As I said, nobody teaches uh, these kind of things. It's only by learning, by doing, and uh, reading more articles published in different formats. And finally, we should have some passion for anything. So I think so. it is the kind of an attitude in terms of uh, being a good, good social science uh, researcher. So I think, or maybe a good social, social scientist and a good analyst, a policy analyst. So you need to have a passion. I think I will stop here. I think that's the last study, so thanks. So thanks for your patience and Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rashid, for uh, such a wonderful and insightful presentation on this publication on social science and research. And, and that was for the newcomers. I think many have joined even later also. For those uh, uh, who joined later, actually, that was Dr. Rashid B. Suleiman, uh, the director of a Center for Research on innovation and science and policy and uh, i think there are many questions uh, addressed to you sir so you please uh, go through the chat box uh, because there are some relevant questions which you need to be addressed and you need to uh, present uh, before uh, uh, conclusion of the uh, webinar can you hear me uh, sorry, sir? I can, sir. hello can you hear me Dr. yeah Sudhir, can you introduce yeah. the questions for the Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, sure. No, no, sure. Then I will, I will, I will, uh, I will go through the questions. Okay, let me go to the chat box. So I thought uh, the presenter himself, uh, if he can, one question. Actually, the last one, I felt uh, uh, good. And uh, um, what is? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, dear sir, um, is it okay to publish our research in other than the social science journals, uh, uh, which are having high NAS rating and impact factor? <laughs> that was one question. Yeah, you can please address it. Then by the time we'll go to the next one. Yeah, no, definitely. Because I'm, I would suggest that, uh, to people, especially youngsters, that no, you should not be too much worried about the NAS rating. I don't trust it. That's a different. I, that's on my own personal take because it varies, and then there are many other kind of pressures that come into it. Sometimes uh, we have seen that actually. One journal is is here this year, and maybe by the time you start publishing in that one, maybe next year it may not be there. By the time it get published, but I think you should basically look for good journals. Maybe you should basically look at, uh, Look at maybe most of the, many international journals, maybe you know higher rating, maybe the kind of you know Thomson Reuters kind of a kind of a rating, than looking at the kind of a, the NAS NAS as the kind of a NAS rating. Definitely, we should publish in not only in disciplinary journals but also in broad agricultural journals, broad agricultural journals which also publish a lot of social science research. Okay. OK, I think you have answered that question. So another question is a social science research done in 10 years before is not in part published is it very uh, very good uh, uh, it is a very good, good study actually and uh, shall whether they can publish it now or not that is a question <laughs> from one of the participants if it is relevant i think of course i think dr rashid Sulaiman, you can answer this question it, yeah. it, depends, actually. it is not that we can always update the kind of an area i'm since i've not seen what is the topic or what is it but i think there is nothing like that we cannot publish and many things yes. are still i think in in many areas, our country still remains the same 10 years before. So I think we don't have rapidly changed in some of the areas. So it also depends on which areas we have basically changed and which areas. So if it, things have been, if the topic is still relevant, there is a, we should publish it. In one way or another, we should publish it. Yes. Another question is actually, uh, I think in your presentation, you were mentioned Think that introduction be an uh, almost an abstract or uh, uh, that was the mention so there was one question like that if we explain those things in the introduction then in methodology part uh, what uh, difference it will make and uh, uh, those things that that is the question actually so uh, i think you can answer okay. that one yeah. actually introduction is only in most cases our introduction is only two paragraphs so in two paragraphs, we are basically mentioning only about what the, what methodology may be 
one sentence on use. But if you look at some of the papers, we normally what we do is in the introduction itself, even the findings we talk about in terms of the study basically is talking of has has implications on the following. Firstly, you make a sentence. Secondly, this is the main argument, and thirdly, and kind everything. Of so in in the in the first two paragraphs, you need to basically convey what is the what the study is about, what methodology we have used. So it is uh, it is different from the abstract. It, there's a difference between abstract and an introduction. And if you look at in the good yes. journals, you can see the difference. Yes. I think it was very clear because uh, in, uh, uh, that is there, there is a difference in introduction because that has to be very abstract form. And another question is it uh, this vocab vocabulary is uh, very important or not? Whether we can write it in simple English? That is another question. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, simple English is what everybody wants. Yeah. We don't want a Tashi Tarur to. That was flair of language. It's very good, but we yeah. don't need that, uh, in the in our research kind of a thing. Simple English, but then we should be. I think style is a different style. Different journals have different style. Style and language are different things. So we need to basically imbibe that style, and then the, the language is a different uh, kind of a thing. And then once we get a good editor, can do a lot. They can do wonders, even in a very kind of a poorly drafted kind of a thing. And another question is actually there are a number of papers papers nowadays, okay, and uh, uh, but it is not reaching to the grassroots level, okay. Uh, the in, 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 means interventions or innovations are not reaching. So what is the lacuna behind this? That is one question. Here. No, I think we need to be very clear. Actually, the number of papers papers are not going to reach to the grassroots level in the sense. What you are trying? Maybe you are always saying there are a lot of good technologies or what? Are, I'm not very clear. But one thing I can say is that write, writing only in research journals is not the best way to reach a large number of people. It is important for the, because often when we have the peer reviewed papers, we need it, especially to make sure that no, it's, a, it's, not, it's a more considered as scientific. So we need to have a, our footprint in the, in the peer reviewed journal space, but we should also have our footprint in the other formats so that you know, it reaches a large number of larger of number of key people policy makers it could be it could be research managers or extension managers or maybe international or donors uh, those who fund research so i think it, that is the point which i wanted to say okay and there is one more question again on the NAS rating, and I think that is not recorded. You have already answered such questions, okay? <laughs> and also the right point you have already mentioned, sir, because of the blog writing, and uh, it was amazing. I think many of us, I think, as uh, to enter into that uh, session, and uh, that will be actually a, another area actually by which uh, we can penetrate or reach the in innovations to the uh, means the needy group. That is one of the practical, I think, uh, suggestion from your side, which I think I also felt uh, uh, it is a need of the hour. Okay. <laughs> In fact, you have already requested many a times, but yes. uh, I could yes. not make it so far. But actually, that is a, because many of us are not uh, looking into that aspect, actually, because that is the one way to reach the needy people, actually. The, uh, if it is a simple blog, instead of uh, writing too much, uh, just in 1,000 or uh, 1500 words i think uh, writing a good blog which can actually penetrate uh, much pretty good actually to the uh, needy group so i think you have in your presentation sir you have focused uh, the multidisciplinary and relevance of interdisciplinary inter institution relevance and also the research topics has to be selected based on the contemporary relevance topics. Naturally, if the research topic is contemporary, then naturally the publication relevance is also there. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, you have mentioned uh, in a befitting way and also presented very nicely. And that is an energy packed presentation that I should say. <laughs> and uh, you have shown that means almost uh, means an encyclopedia in the social science. And as you told with the economics and extension background, I think you made it presented it very well.
and that was amazing presentation okay so thank you because i i know you very well so uh, from my side of course my thanks uh, to dr rashid sulaiman now i think for the making the concluding remarks uh, i invite our um, organizer dr binu p boni uh, professor and uh, adr of uh, kerala agriculture university and professor and head of agriculture extension department and also co pi of nhep program so dr binu p boni to make the concluding remarks now yes i can find dr rashid i missed it the way you have introduced thank you sudhi for moderating in such a nice way thank you and uh, over to rashid it was uh, what should i say my heartfelt thanks sir. and moreover despite the minor technical glitches in the start um, i think we we could able to reach almost all the participants who have joined us and i should say i am one of the happiest organizers of the day for the day but not because uh, rashid has done it i knew it the name itself the quality and the and the content is guaranteed but just because i could host it it was a long uh, um, it just say a dream so to, uh, to have a talk by dr uh, rashid Uh, for the for for the benefit of our students and the faculty here, and that could be materialized. That is a great thing about us. And I know, despite his very hectic schedule, he has found time for us just because uh, it was asked from the Kerala Agriculture University. And uh, thank you so much sir, for sharing your valuable time with us. Thank you. Okay. And thank I also thank all the participants for okay. the, for bye, bye. Bye. for the okay. Once again, hello, Rashid sir. Thanks. Yes, yes. Thanks from the moderator okay. side also, okay. and I thank each and every participants also. I think for uh, uh, attending the session. Can uh, I think throughout the session? I think. students or uh, i think the social, those who are entered in the social science or economics uh, aspects and i take this opportunity to thank our vibrant director of research also i hope he is uh, uh, is also attending so thanks to dr mathu subramaniam director of research of kerala agriculture university and maybe uh, 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 classmate of dr rashid sulaiman also he was actually <laughs> i i I think even after seeing the presence of uh, uh, Dr. Rashid Suleiman, he forgot uh, to present, introduce the topic. He introduced. He was concentrating more in introducing the his classmate and the speaker. Okay, so he he, he deviated from the topic. I should say, but uh, uh, that is because of uh, the I think uh, the, uh, the strong relationship with the speaker actually. So anyway, I, actually we are. Sudhir, we all were having an alumni meet online. That was okay. the reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay that is the reason so uh, okay so anyway it was uh, fine and he uh, he is uh, already introduced uh, very nicely to the speaker and uh, uh, then i think all the uh, participants have enjoyed now any any uh, formal word of thanks by sulaja or dr binu piboni you are finished you are done okay it has been okay. we have been uh, prepared some time So thank you once more, Dr. Prashi, Dr. Sudhir, uh, the professors, and all the participants on behalf of uh, Kerala Agriculture University, and also on my personal behalf. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. It was an amazing afternoon. Bye. Bye. Bye.